All right, gentlemen, in section two of chapter 12, we do a little history lesson, kind of looking at the evolution of the Supreme Court and the federal court system in general, but more specifically the Supreme Court and looking at it, its changing role and the dynamic and interaction it has had throughout or with the government and throughout American history. So, <clears throat> as we've somewhat touched upon, while not specifically written into the United States Constitution, the power of judicial review is one that most founding fathers probably intended or thought the Supreme Court should have, or the federal courts should have. Now, when I say judicial review, though, you, we need to understand that they, they probably had a different interpretation of how it would be applied and used, which I think me trying to work my way through these words will become a little more clear here in a moment as, as we kind of look at this change in evolution in the court. I think you'll, you'll see what I'm, what I'm trying to get at, which was I, I think the founders expected the courts to kind of you know, call balls and strikes, um, so to speak, that they would determine what was valid or what was invalid and that would be the end of it, right? They did not, I think, expect the courts to go beyond that um, and, and to make statements about you know, broader policy or law in general. That's the thing. I think the court has gone beyond where the founders thought it would go. So let's, let's talk about this more, and maybe what I'm trying to get at will become a little more clear. Yeah, they did not... They did not expect the courts to, to go beyond the traditional view. And the traditional view of a civil court is the judges basically are brought a case. There are two parties with a disagreement, and it's the judge's job to determine who is right in that disagreement. Not who the judge feels is right. Who is right based on existing law? You know, we have two parties that entered into a contract and one of them supposedly broke the contract and, and all this other stuff, the judge is supposed to hear the case, hear the evidence, hear the facts, and then is supposed to determine who is right or wrong, who's guilty or innocent, however you want to term it, right? That judges would find and apply existing law. Excuse me. <coughs> that, that basically a judge is an expert on existing law, and they will be able to figure out which laws are applicable, which ones are not. Maybe there's some little wrinkle or rub in the law that people weren't aware of that the judge brings to light. and It's important in this instance. Something along that nature, right? The idea of judicial activism, which we talked about previously. I'll back up for a moment. Judicial activism, remember, the idea of I'm trying to find the deeper hidden meanings, right? I'm going to try and apply... Um, you know, the principles that they really meant. Not what they said, but the, the, the hidden kind of um, a word we're going to have, penumbra. Right? We, we used that term when we were talking about the right to privacy. Um, when we were talking about Roe v. Wade. There was no concept of penumbras previously. The idea of judges finding the hidden shadows of law. Um, you know, this concept didn't exist in traditional views of the role of courts and judges. And so when the Founding Fathers were like, yeah, yeah, judicial review, they did not expect anybody to do anything remotely close to what we would call today judicial activism. Now, <clears throat> that traditional view of, oh, they simply interpret the law, they don't make policy or help write policy, help justify the existence of the judiciary. As Alexander Hamilton said in Federal 78, he called the judicial branch the least dangerous of the three branches to your political rights, pointing out again, they did not have the power of the sword. They did not have the power of the purse. They could take no active resolution, whatever. If you think about it, that is very true still to this day in some regard. You have to have a case. Somebody's got to bring up a lawsuit. The court can think something is totally unjust and wrong. They, on their own volition, cannot do something. They have to react to circumstances. Somebody's got to bring them a case before they can open their mouth. So that is one thing that Alexander Hamilton got right that is still true today. As he wrote, liberty can have nothing to fear from the judiciary alone. 
And that was in part how, again, the Federalists were able to try and convince people to allow a federal court system to be created. Now, there has clearly been an evolution, a change over the course of 200 plus years. And really, you can look at the federal court's evolution in three eras or three time periods, okay? And we're going to look at all three of them. Basically, you've got the founding until the Civil War. So you've got the start of the Constitution until the Civil War, basically. We'll come back, calm down. You've got Civil War till New Deal, and then New Deal to present. Okay, those are really the three eras that you can break it into. You've got roughly the first 75 years of America under the Constitution, roughly. Then you've got the next eh, 75 or so years of American history. Again, roughly. It's a little bit less than 75. It's more like 70. And then you've got the next 75 or so years. It's kind of convenient in that. It's really in thirds if you kind of look at it in the broad spectrum of American history under the Constitution. So let's look at each one. From 1789 to the Civil War, the most dominant question um, was really that whole federalism question. Nation versus state. Who's got the power? Do, do the states have the power? Does the federal government have the power? Is it concurrent? You know, where where and what and how does this all shake out? And the most important power quickly became slavery, or that was the hot topic. These are kind of intertwined, right? The idea of national supremacy and the institution of slavery. Uh, I, you, you can make the argument that the Civil War was rooted not in slavery, but in a battle over states' rights, and, and a battle to, to curb the power of the federal government. Yeah, to regulate and end slavery. Uh -huh. If you take slavery out of the equation, there is no civil war, right? If you take slavery out of the equation, half these arguments don't exist. So, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, call me a revisionist, I guess. I, I don't think I'm really revising anything. I'm, I'm going with the standard argument. The Civil War was rooted in slavery. This was the big debate, okay? They kind of go hand in hand. But the biggest political question, judicial question, the role of the federal government in this brand new, you know, arrangement we had, you know, federalism, how is it going to play out? And the role of the federal government in the slavery question and just the slavery question overall. That was the dominant issue. And the answer to most of this was brought to you courtesy of Chief Justice John Marshall. That's right. He is in the Hall of Fame. He is the longest serving Supreme Court Chief Justice. 34 years. Um, the guy right behind him, Roger Taney, is, uh, I believe, in second place on that on that list. But anyhow, long-serving Chief Justice, and he really kind of, of made the court what it was. And another thing about him, he was a big supporter in the power of the federal government. He established the supremacy of the federal government. Well, he and his court. Right? He oversaw a number of decisions which helped solidify in this grand argument, the power of the federal government over the states. First of all, he was there for the case of Marbury v. Madison in 1803, and then McCulloch v. Maryland in 1819. Um, <clears throat> so 1803, Marbury v. Madison, if you remember your American history, that is where Marshall held that the Supreme Court could declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. Really quick Cliff Notes version. Mr. Marbury um, tried to, uh, what was it? He, he sent a, um, oh, not an injunction. Uh, he filed paperwork directly with the Supreme Court. I'm losing my mind. I'm going to go with the term court order. I can't remember specifically. Basically, Mr. Marbury went to the United States Supreme Court because the Judiciary Act of 1789 said he should go to the Supreme Court if he wanted a federal court order to try and get Mr. Madison to deliver his paperwork so he could become Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia. 
And the Supreme Court turned around and said, no, we can't do that. We don't have jurisdiction. The Judiciary Act of 1789 grants us a jurisdiction, which is not an original jurisdiction, excuse me, not appellate, but an original jurisdiction, which is not granted to us by the Constitution, Article 3. So, sorry, you guys wrote a law that's not right. All right. So there, there was born judicial review. For those of you who have forgotten, judicial review was born in the case of Marbury v. Madison. All right. Now, the other big one that there were a number of them, but another big one that we have to talk about is McCulloch v. Maryland. This is the case in which the state of Maryland wanted to tax the Bank of the United States. Right. And. They went in there, and uh, the clerk was Mr. McCulloch. He wasn't like the president or anything. He was like literally the guy at the front desk, the teller. And they're like, yeah, we're here to collect Maryland state taxes on the Bank of the United States. He's like, I don't have authorization to pay any taxes to your state. They arrested him for failure to pay taxes. His case eventually went to the United States Supreme Court in 1819. Not only was it ruled that the state did not have the authority to tax the Bank of the United States. It ruled that um, <clears throat> basically federal law was supreme to state law, that a federal institution could not be interfered with by a state government or state law. Um, oh, Mr. Mar Mr. McCulloch was innocent um, because Maryland could not tax him, so he did not have to pay any taxes. And it also, by the way, um, confirmed implied powers again for those of you remembering your american history now it's all coming back to me sir this was you know the bank of the united states was the institution that was created by alexander hamilton by taking a broad brush to that necessary and proper clause we had never had a court case which really settled the question of if the bus was legal or not there'd been a huge argument over the legality of the bus when it was first created this was the case that confirmed no the bus is legal the the, the bank can't exist the government needs it etc so again, granting broad powers to the federal government, not in the United States Constitution, asserting the supremacy of a federal institution over state law, the supremacy of federal law. McCulloch versus Maryland was huge. There was an 1816 case in which the Supreme Court rejected a Virginia court's ruling um, involving a Virginia law and the Treaty of Paris. That was another great example of ruling in favor of um, federal supremacy. Right. I want to point out that the Supreme Court overruled a Virginia Supreme Court ruling. The state of Virginia courts had already ruled in favor of the law of the state of Virginia, which allowed you to basically ban land sales by enemies, loyalists. And they ruled, no, you're wrong. So there you have the Supreme Court overruling a state Supreme Court. Um, another one was the case of Gibbons v. Ogden. You might remember 1824, a case involving steamboats. New York gave Robert Fulton, the inventor of the steamboat Monopoly, to operate all steamboats on the rivers in the state, including the Hudson. The state of New Jersey basically sued, and Marshall agreed that the state of New York did not have the authority to grant a monopoly on a river shared by the two states. And he claimed that only the federal government had the right to regulate interstate commerce. Right? Now, all of these are the big heavy ones that are in your American history class. Those people who had me for American history, they, they literally go through all four of these cases in great detail in your book um, very early on, because these are the groundbreaking cases that establish federal dominance. And all of them took place under the guidance of Mr. John Marshall. And it, of course, all seems obvious to us now, but we all live... 200 years, basically, after all of these. Gibbons v. Ogden was uh, 196 years ago. You know, all of these cases are 200 years or older at this point, basically. And so we've been living in a country which has been working from these rulings for close to two centuries. And so, yes, it seems review, it seems obvious and apparent to us, but for these people, these were fresh questions. I realize that this is going to sound like a bit of a stretch, but this is like us looking at segregation, or I should say Brown versus Board. You know? So as I was saying, 
Um, this is kind of like us looking back at Brown vs. Board or some of the other rulings that came out of the, the civil rights era. You know, where we look at it and we're like, yeah, that's a no-brainer, man. Come on. Well, no, that was an argument for those people. Um, I am, I'm not 100% sure, but there's a good chance that maybe 20 or 30 years from now, some of the things that we've been arguing and debating in the courts, you know, over the last 10 or so years, people are going to look at it and go, that's a no-brainer. I can't even believe you guys were arguing that one. Um, you know, it's one of those things you have to put yourself in their moment, in their situation. Steamboats were a brand new invention. Um, the concept of granting state monopolies to a device that moved uh, across state boundaries so easily and freely, that had never occurred before. Uh, it's like the Internet. You know, how do you regulate the Internet? We kind of talked about this a little bit in here previously when we were talking about uh, the issues of laws governing pornography and, and, the, and the Internet. And how it suddenly becomes so tricky because the old way of doing things no longer applies because this new technology has basically outstripped the old circumstances. You know, it has dramatically changed the, the environment in which we're trying to apply the law. And, and you don't even need the steamboat case to kind of look at this and go, yeah, this, this is the big argument. You know, this was the argument involving federalism, the power of the federal government versus the states. Yes, the Constitution got passed, so in some regards, I guess you could argue people were accepting a, a more powerful central government than previously. But again, there's a lot of gray area, there's a lot of wiggle room, and the courts were trying to solidify it, were trying to work through it all. Okay, Now, you would think that Mr. Marshall secured national supremacy over the states. Um, but, you know, and he did on a number of topics, but that during slavery became the second big issue. Uh, it, it was always kind of there under the surface, but it became the, the, the second half of this era, right? Starting in really the 1820s up until the Civil War, the issue is going to be slavery and the ability to regulate it, to prevent the spread of it, to abolish it, all these things, right? That's going to be under the leadership of Roger Taney, mostly. Roger Taney succeeded John Marshall as the Chief Justice in 1836. President Jackson actually chose him because Taney was an advocate of states' rights. So Jackson, a big believer in states' rights, purposely chose a replacement for Mr. Marshall, who was a states' rights kind of man, hoping that he could slowly reverse some of the decisions that had been made the previous 30 years, roughly. Now... The famous case, the most famous case that took place under the Taney Court is perhaps one of the worst cases, if not the worst case, in all of American um, Supreme Court history. The Dred Scott decision. A slave, Dred Scott, had been taken by his owner to a territory where slavery was illegal, basically Minnesota. Um, Scott claimed that when he was in that territory, he was a free man because there's no way for him to have been a slave in a territory that never had allowed slavery, ever. It had never had the institution, so there's no way for him to be a slave there during that time period. All right? So he ceased to be a slave, and he was now a kidnapped victim in Missouri. Well, Taney held, he and his court held, that Negroes were not citizens and therefore... Um, well, were not citizens and could not become citizens of the United States and therefore did not have standing in his court. And so basically there could not be a court case because this man is not a citizen, so how can he sue a state for anything, etc. Um, and then he went on and made this broad statement. I mean, that was bad enough, but at least there's some sort of legal basis. Not saying it's okay, just saying the first half of the ruling, okay, I guess. The problem is where he then goes off the deep end and suddenly announces that the Missouri Compromise, which is what we've been rolling on since 1820, was unconstitutional. And he basically declared the federal government has no right to regulate slavery in the territories, right? And all everything we had done for roughly 30 years, he just threw out the window, right? And he didn't really base it on a whole lot of solid work. And this 
guaranteed a civil war, basically. You know, the outcry was enormous. Taney and his court were discredited, for at least the time being. And, <clears throat> you know, we're going to have a civil war. Okay, so let's have the civil war. All right, we have the civil war. After the civil war, gentlemen, um, we're going to have a new era involving the court. It's going to be the Civil War to New Deal era. So basically 1865 to uh, 1930s, right, to FDR. Okay. During this period, the dominant issue was about economic regulation. All right. And the role of the government versus the role of the states and what is interstate commerce and what is not interstate commerce. You know that. If you think about it, look at historical context, the big issue of overall sovereignty has been established. This is no longer an argument, right? So the two hot topics of the first period of American judicial history have either been resolved to some degree or disappeared. Now the big issue is America's growing economy. Um, this is the Gilded Age. This is the period of America's great industrialization. Railroads are going to be stretching across the country. Are they a form of interstate or intrastate? And as we've talked about in this class, at what point does interstate commerce become interstate commerce? When's the magic moment, right? These are, again, questions that the Supreme Court will have to answer. One thing I will point out, the Supreme Court showed itself a definite believer in private property. Right? They defended and protected private property every way that they could. Um, the court also took an interesting tilt on the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, adopted in 1868 to protect African American citizenship from hostile southern states, included a clause that said that you could deprive no person of life, liberty, or property without due process. The no state, excuse me. That phrase of deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process clearly showed a government desire to protect the institution of property. Now, the question is, are companies and corporations, are they guaranteed or do they have the same rights that an individual has? And the court said, well, yes. A firm or corporation, just like an individual, has certain rights. Um, if you think about it, corporations are treated in the courts like you would treat an individual. I mean, all the laws that apply to you and I apply to corporations, and they're basically applied to corporations. You know, they are they are held towards corporations the same manner they are us. And so the courts are like, yeah, they they are the same thing. We've got to protect that. Corporations have rights. You have rights. Companies have rights. Right. And the court, of course, found itself deep in the weeds, right? It began having to rule on government regulation and labor unions and strikes and all sorts of stuff. And judicial activism was born, if you want to think about it. This is the era when judicial activism had to be born. Because we were talking about, by this point, we'd gotten into topics that really weren't in the Constitution. And topics that there's no way our founders really had a view of them, because there's no way our founders could have foresaw what we were dealing with, right? And so now we are in a realm where we can't go to the Federalist Papers necessarily. We can't look at the journal writings. You know, all the founders are long gone. We're going to have to figure this one out. And this is the era when judicial activism was born. The court began to become a sort of arbitrator when it came to some of these topics. In the first 75 years of our country's history, only two federal laws were held to be unconstitutional. We actually talked about those. The Judiciary Act of 1789 and the, the Missouri Compromise. That's it, right? During these 75 years of American judicial history, 71. We go from two in 75 years to 71 over these 75 years. Of the roughly 1,300 state laws that were held to be in conflict with the federal constitution since 1789, 1,200 were overturned after 1870. So basically, when you look at it, of the 1,300 that have been challenged and overturned, 1,200 took place in the last two-thirds of American history. So the first third, not a lot, you know. 
Um, in one decade alone, the 1880s, five federal and 48 state laws were declared unconstitutional. Right? This is an era of judicial activism. Now, <clears throat> many of these decisions, again, as I said, showed that the court was very much sympathetic and going to protect the institution of private property. Um, but the court gentlemen also showed a little bit of a, of a dual personality. It allowed the regulation of certain things by the United States government that people might not have thought about previously. For example, it upheld rules requiring the railroads to improve their safety. It approved state anti-liquor laws, mine safety laws, worker compensation laws. It allowed the states to regulate fire insurance companies, you know, state laws regulating wages and hours. Um, and for those of you who are like, yeah, but you just said a lot of state. Regardless, it's state regulation over private individuals, private institutions, private business, private property, right? It's my mine. Who is the state to come tell me how to run my mine? I bought that mine, right? It's my factory. Who are you to tell me what I have to pay my workers in my factory? They don't like it, they can leave. Right, And so this was an era when, yes, we had a lot of protection of private property against the government's intrusion at times, but there was another side of the coin. 558 cases involving the 14th Amendment in front of the Supreme Court upheld state regulation 80% of the time. Right, So the 14th Amendment is a double-edged sword. You can use it to stop the government, or you can use it to stop people. It, it's really weird. Um, I do want to point out, too, you know, to say the government was or the court was pro-business or anti-regulation is you can't be that simplistic. OK, if you're trying to get some easy cookie cutter for the court during this time period, you can't do it because it's too complex. And as I said a number of times, um, the devil is in the details of the case. Not every case is identical. There are rubs and wrinkles and details that change the nature of a case. They might not seem big to you and I, but in the eyes of a court, they are the difference, right? And so you can't just say, oh, well, they were, they were pro-business or, oh, they were pro-regulation. You can't go that simplistically. You can't even just do it off a score sheet. You can't just, well, they, this amount of time ruled in favor of private property and this amount of time in favor of regulation. That doesn't assure that they were pro-anything. Maybe that's just the nature of a lot of the cases they were dealt. But the fact, you know, it, it's the whole quality over quantity. A handful of very important rulings, I think, outweighs a bunch of just generic, yeah, no-brainers. I do want to point out, too, if there's a loser in this era, it's African Americans, because the 14th Amendment was written to protect them. And the Supreme Court, over and over and over again, took a very narrow view of both the 14th and 15th Amendments. And instead of granting them wide protections, it granted them very narrow protections. And that is what basically set the groundwork for the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson ruling, which created sanctioned segregation in this country, which would not be overturned until 1954. Now, looking at the third era of America's courts, the New Deal until present, basically. And this is an era where we're going to have a lot of cases involving liberty, freedom, personal law, so to speak. <clears throat> now, from 1937 to 1974, the Supreme Court did not overturn a single federal law to regulate business. Not a single one. But it did overturn 36 congressional enactments that violated what it termed personal liberty. Right? So you can see the focus of the court has gone from economics to, like, freedom. Okay? Now, how this all occurred, occurred when one justice changed his mind. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, what are some examples, Mr. McCoy? All right. Um, it overturned as unconstitutional laws that restricted freedom of speech, denied passports to communists, permitted the government to revoke citizenship, withheld, withheld mail, restricted availability to government benefits, the list goes on and on, right? It all started out when one judge changed his mind. At the start of the New Deal, the court, by a narrow margin, was controlled by judges who opposed it, right? Who opposed New Deal legislation. 
the welfare system that was being created, and the broad federal regulations. You know, you might remember from your American history class that the Supreme Court overturned the NRA, um, the National Recovery Act. The Supreme Court overturned eventually the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The Supreme Court overturned a number of New Deal legislations, claiming that basically that the that the Congress had just granted the executive branch discretion and control over matters that were not theirs. Now, Franklin Roosevelt was determined to get this legislation through, and he knew um, after his his first term that the Supreme Court wasn't going to change. Right, no justices had retired or died. There were no vacancies, and after his epic re-election victory in '36, he decided it was time to make a move. The famed court packing plan. This is where Roosevelt threw out this theory, where it was like if a judge turns, se- the court is overworked. There are all these old dudes facing all this, these long hours and all this hard work. So what we're going to do is if a judge turns 70 and they've been on the court for 10 years, at least, if they don't retire within six months, I can name an additional judge to help carry the load. Um, and, and this would open the door to Roosevelt either forcing a bunch of judges to retire and then he could replace them with people that were pro-New Deal, or he could just appoint a bunch of pro-New Dealers and kind of change the balance of power. The court was basically five to four. Five to four against the New Deal. It's like every one of these big rulings that struck down something in the New Deal was five to four against, five to four against, right? Now, Roosevelt had a chance to add up to six judges on the way he had written his court-packing plan. But what changed everything, and and this was a huge argument, right? Before the bill could be voted on, um, everything kind of cooled out. It was never voted on. It was quietly killed in the Senate. But before it could be voted on, a judge changed his mind. Okay? Owen Roberts, Owen Roberts, one of the Supreme Court judges who consistently voted against the New Deal, came came to decide that, you know what, the people want the New Deal. Clearly, right? We keep striking it down, and they keep passing more of it, and no one complains, and this guy got reelected by an absolute landslide. If the American people did not agree with his broad welfare program, they wouldn't have reelected him by one of the widest margins in American history, right? And so Owen Roberts decided, basically, that he was just going to bow to public opinion. It's known in history as the switch in time that saved nine, which is a play on the old um, adage, a stitch in time saves nine. Um, Interestingly, he had changed his mind before FDR announced his plan, because that's the other thing. Historians like to argue that the court packing plan intimidated the Supreme Court, and the court changed its mind because it was afraid of losing its judicial independence if it didn't. So, like, they caved this one time to avoid this this overwhelmingly popular president. That's not true. Justice Roberts changed his mind before FDR announced a court-packing plan. As your book mentions, like Chief Justice Taney had a century earlier, he had basically bowed to public opinion and changed his opinion um, and, and, and kind of issued a ruling um, that would prevent someone attacking the Supreme Court directly. Not long after he started voting in favor of the New Deal, a few of the older judges retired. Roosevelt was able to replace him with his own folks. Um, And basically the court now became pro-New Deal. That argument over. Now it began to focus on political liberties and civil rights. Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, who came from California, uh, was put on the court in 1953. Dwight Eisenhower appointed him. And he became uh, probably the head of one of the most activist periods in all of Supreme Court history. Um, this activism arose, not shockingly, during the era of, of the birth of the, the major civil rights movement in this country. Um, and it came during a time period, though, when people were redefining the role of the government and the citizen and liberty and the ability of the government to intrude upon our, our life. The court, gentlemen, had always seen itself as protecting us from arbitrary government. 
Okay, but understand, up until 1937, that was the sort of protection that conservatives would have liked. The sort of protection where it's like, well, it doesn't say the government can do that, so government, you can't do that. It, it was a very old school, well, what does the Constitution say? You know, the kind of thing conservatives like, where somebody pulls out a Constitution and where they can't find it in the Constitution, so they go, sorry, government, you can't do that, right? That's the kind of protecting us from government that conservatives liked, and it's how we used to do things. But then, under Chief Justice Warren, the court began to take a new sort of tilt. The kind of tilt that liberals would like. Right? The kind of approach where it's like, well, we're going to kind of take this word, and we're going to stretch it, and we're going to... Right? Um... And, and thus was born some of the stuff that we've seen um, in the last 50 years. Um, I know the Warren Court took, took the reins in, in 53, so it's been a little bit longer than 50 years, even a little longer than 60 years. But, you know, some of the cases that we've talked about or some of the issues we've talked about in our class, you know, the, the you can't make... You, know, you can't pray in school. You can't make people say a prayer in school. You know, Roe v. Wade... Um, all of the things involving um, criminals that we talked about previously, you know, the Miranda warning, Miranda rights, all these cases involving search and seizure, Matt v. Ohio, if you remember that one. All these came down from this new interpretation of what can the government do versus what the government can't do versus what they meant the government to be able to do. Very activist time period. Now, I do want to point out, as we try and wrap up this discussion of the evolution of the court, for many decades, the Supreme Court basically kind of allowed the federal government to have the authority. But since 1992, the court has, by narrow majorities, begun to reassert some state control over federal power. Um, it's been a slight reversal, a slight reversal. You know, a changing interpretation of interstate commerce and states' rights. <clears throat> Now, again, I'm not saying that, you know, this we, we, we've completely 180, but you've seen over the last 30-ish years, almost 30 years, you've seen a court which kind of tends to favor the states a little more. For example, um, a lot of times things are passed using interstate commerce, and they said that's not interstate commerce, you know. When Congress passed a bill that forbid anyone from carrying a gun near a school, arguing it's a form of interstate commerce, the court's like, that's not interstate commerce. Um, a year later, it struck down a law that allowed Indian tribes to sue the states in federal court, arguing that Congress lacks the power to ignore the sovereign immunity of the states. Um, that is the right but under the 11th Amendment to not be sued in federal court. Um, it also held... Uh, the Brady Bill, which came after the uh, assassination attempt, it, it was a result of, of one of um, the cabinet of Ronald Reagan getting hit by a bullet during that. The Brady Gun Control Law, um, it held that the Brady Gun Control Law could not be used to require local law enforcement officials to do background checks on people trying to buy weapons. You know, the argument of federal background checks. The federal government was like, yeah, yeah, the states will take care of that. And states like, why are we, your background check, you do it. Like, why are we doing it? We got enough to do. You want to have these background checks? You do it. And they're like, well, it's a form of interstate commerce. Like, that's great. Yeah, you do it. You're in charge of interstate commerce. You call dibs, you're game. All right? Another great example is Obamacare, um, one from, from fairly recent American history. You know, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, there's a lot of questions. And several states argued that the requirement for everyone to purchase health insurance through the government was unconstitutional. And it went to the courts. And um, the Supreme Court decided that the law's individual mandate that required people to purchase minimum essential health insurance um, was a, a, a penalty, so to speak. Um, and, you know... You had that case of National Federa Fed uh, National Federation of Independent Business um, versus Sibelia, whatever, <laughs> where basically Obamacare um, kind of was hauled into court for the first time. All right. <clears throat>
pot. Okay. All right, I'm I'm misspeaking on this one because I got confused. What what they said here? I apologize. Was that the penalty that you have to pay? All right, the tax penalty that you have to pay um, is a permissible federal tax. Okay. I got confused. I apologize. I got confused what I'm about to say. Okay, so this case, it's like, well, you can do that. You, you can have people pay this, this penalty. Um, <clears throat> but then they went on to have the cases where in 2014, here's what I want to talk about. In 2014, um, there were the cases involving the laws mandate that state governments expand their Medicaid coverage. Here's what I meant to say. So there was the part of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, where it's like, yeah, yeah, you've got to broaden this and expand that, and states have to this and states have to that. And the court ruled that violates the Constitution by impermissibly threatening states with the loss of their existing federal funding for a program. Um, that basically the whole do it or else, they were like, that's not very right. Um, I do want to point out that the Affordable Care Act, though, was upheld in 2015 in a ruling of six to three. Um, you know, the federal government provides subsidies for people to buy it on their exchange. It's been going back and forth. Um, my point is, again, like I said previously, when people are like, oh, the court was pro this. Oh, the court was pro that. No, it's too complex. The court is not pro Affordable Care Act. The court is not pro states' rights. It's not pro federal government. It's not... The court is taking it as it comes. It just seems like the court tends to be taking a little more. It's giving states' rights a second look, a look it didn't give for a long time, right, during, like, the New Deal era, right? It's giving states' rights another look, and it's not giving the Affordable Care Act the green light. The Affordable Care Act is getting hauled into court, and there are parts of it that get nipped apart, okay? And here we are today, all right? Here we are today with a court that has a lot of baggage and a lot of history and seems to be changing its, its mind sometimes. Um, here you go. You know, what I said previously, where the court seemed to be focused on economics. Look at the number of laws, federal laws, overturned by the Supreme Court involving economics during the, you know, 1900 to the New Deal, right? And the number of civil liberty laws. And then look at the number of civil liberty laws. Oh, gee, there's the start of the you know, civil rights movement. Like, look at the 70s and the 80s. Um, so you can see the focus of the court changed. 